members of the um, we also welcome the members of the Aquarian family present here. And um, this program is basically um, a meeting to commemorate the second anniversary of the passing of our great leader and elder, Dr. Kisito Okwere, who passed on exactly two years ago today. Last year, the Center for Integral Faith Formation was launched. And um, this year now, we are having our inaugural meeting, an inaugural mm -hmm. session in his memory. We have um, a, a program and um, the topic of the discussion is building a connection between the spiritual and the secular life. All of us have um, to go through this, you know, various situations in our lives where we're trying to balance our faith against our work or against our daily lives. So what we want to do here is to go through, have a discussion on how to make sure that our faith is the foundation of our secular life. So we have to discuss this um, five people on our panel. We have mm -hmm. Reverend Father Sylvester Ajua. We have Mrs. Eno Edet. We have Dr. Ima Imafidon. We have Reverend Sister Dr. Christiana Charles Edika. And we have Dr. Okechuku Ama. We will begin with an opening prayer. Um, I think we should just ask Sister, Sister Charles, to please give us an opening prayer. And at the end, Father will give us the closing prayer and bless us. Can we begin that way? Sister Charles, please unmute yourself and give us an opening prayer. Thank you. Okay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Come, O Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle in us the fire of your love. Come, Holy Spirit, Fear the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in us the fire of your love. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for this hour. We thank you for the day. We thank you because you have brought us from our different locations of work to come and discuss this work and how we integrate our faith in our working places. In a world that is now trying to be void, to separate, to take away God from the public space. Father, we thank you for the life of your son, the soldier who went ahead of us, Dr. Opere, whom we celebrate his uh, second year anniversary of passing on to glory in heaven. He left us an example to follow. He was a soldier, a soldier not just in the parameters of the church, but also in his workplace. Testimonies show that he integrated his faith and his work life. We ask you that our discussion today may reach worldwide. We are people of faith. We know that without that faith, our secular life, how we live our public life, how we experience our public life has no meaning, is meaningless. Put power and conviction in our words, put wisdom in it. Let it not just be intellectual, but also spiritual so that the men and women of our time who are still looking for a balance between their faith and their daily lives may learn a lot, not only from what we say, but we also learn from this man who celebrates his life today. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, sister. Um, I will just run through the program for today. And we have here is a one hour event. We have next a brief introduction of the panelists. We have the contributions by the panelists, five minutes each per person, well, five minutes per person. We have interventions from the audience of two minutes. 
of five people. Then we'll round up again by calling on the panelists and then we'll have a brief introduction to the center by Sister Fulusha. We'll have a word from the Opera family and then we'll have a closing prayer. So it's a very brief event. And um, so I'll go straight now to in, um, introduce the members of the panel. First of all, we have Reverend Father Sylvester Adjua, who is a spiritual director and the founder of LIFE, which is a lay initiative for evangelization. He is a chaplain for all in English speaking, all English speaking Catholics in the Archdiocese of Berlin, Germany. This year happens to be the 25th anniversary of his priestly ordination. Father is passionate about evangelization and empowerment of the laity for evangelization. Next we have Mrs. Enobong Edet. Mrs. Enobong Edet is very passionate about her faith and active in the Catholic Charismatic Renewal of Nigeria, where she led the teaching ministry at both parish and dinnery levels, as well as being the current secretary of the Lagos Archer Cesar Teaching Ministry of the Catholic Charismatic Renewal. She's also the current president of the Catholic Women Organization of Nigeria, Ave Maria Catholic Church Lekki, as well as the chairperson of the Secretariat Committee of the Lee Initiative for Evangelization Life. Mrs. Edet is currently a trainer and a management consultant for various business advisory needs. We have also Sister Dr. Christiana Charles Ngozi Idika, who is a lecturer at the Catholic University, Mainz, Germany, and a visiting lecturer at the Center for Migration Studies. Sister is the International Anchor for Ecoro Forum, Berlin, Germany, and a member of the Calabar Society for Philosophy. She's engaged in various African development projects. She's a member of the Religious Congregation of the Daughters of Mary, Mother of Mercy, Umwahia, Nigeria. She's a retreat preacher, public and motivational speaker. She holds a master's in e-creator and is a content creator. We have also on the panel, Dr. Emmanuel Imafidon, who is a parishioner at the Catholic Church of the Transfiguration VGC. He currently lectures at the Lagos Business School and prior to this, he had worked in the education, manufacturing, and energy sectors in Nigeria. We have on the panel as well, we have Dr. Okechuku Ama, who is a parishioner at the Regina Patches Catholic Church, He's a member of LIFE and a member of the Catholic Charismatic Renewal of Nigeria. So that rounds up all the five panelists for this event. As I said earlier, the topic is building a connection between the spiritual and the secular life. How do we build this connection? So I will first of all throw out the question, um, what do we mean by spiritual life? What do we mean by the secular life? Show us by examples. You have five minutes each. How to uh, build a connection between these two. Thank you very much. We'll start with Father. We did it, Father. We did it. I'm watching in the meeting now. Okay, thank you, dear all. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for participating at this today's event. And today we honor and remember our dear beloved. Soldier of Christ, Dr. Kizito Pere. And we discuss this particular topic, the secular and the spiritual. Of course, it's very, the wordings are very clear. We can really categorize things that fall to the spiritual and things that fall to the secular. We always try to draw this dualism, the dualism of the secular and the dualism of the spiritual. We also have this dual nature, the soul and body. And of course, we are always want to close the gap between this dualism that continues to exist in the context of living in this world. We draw the mark of the time we are Christians and the times probably we are not Christians. 
But should there be that gap? What is the definition and the margin and the missing link between doing this and being this? And what is the timeline? But we know by the Lord who created us, created us body and soul. And the one classical ancient definition of man is a rational being, a being with body and soul. Man is definitely soul and body united together. If you see a bodiless human being, the person is not really living. But if you see one, a soul that has no body, is pure spirit. So all it has to do is, how do we get man in his full, God's full intention of creating man to be body and soul together and to live according to his glory, to glorify him? We will answer in the catechism, why did God create us? He created us to love him, to serve him, and at the end, to live with him in eternity. And that means this man created by God, body and soul, is meant to serve God in body and soul. And then at the end, be able to join God in the beatific vision. And of course, we have an icon who could also lead us in practical times. Dr. Kizito Berry, we saw how he lived. We can be a witness to this. He, in his life, was able to integrate these two aspects in walking and living his life. We can all be a witness to this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father. Thank you. Um, can we call on Brother Ima Imafidon, please? How do you connect the missing, the link between he the should, He should unmute himself. Sorry, I was talking okay. without muting. Ah, uh, okay. My apologies. So, just taking it off from where uh, Father left it off, mm -hmm. just to say that in trying to extray that dualism that he referred to and trying to answer the question you asked, which is building a connection. In my five minutes, I'll maybe I'll just look at the issues that are at play in, in that trying to live out the spiritual life in the secular world. The world, as we know, as Christians, we already know what the world represents. Uh, the, 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 the fundamental thing, first of all, is for the child of God to remember that there is a mortal combat between two kingdoms. It is fundamental. We are born into that combat. It will just be foolhardiness not to live in the reality and consciousness of that of those two kingdoms that are at war. And we are citizens of one, and it's a zero-sum game between the two kingdoms. What this one loses is what this one gains. What this one gains is what this one loses. So as I am a citizen of one, managing that dualism, try to live that spiritual life of that spiritual kingdom in an environment that I have no choice around. When I say choice, I don't have a choice than being in the world. Instead, I'm, instead I'm living on this earth or I'm out of it. As long as I'm living in it, the call upon us is to live this spiritual life that has its own terms of reference in an environment that has opposing terms of reference. So when I lower myself into, okay, what are the things we really struggle with there? We struggle with relativism. And we are all aware about what that means in terms of just not having a hard and fast rule or clinical divide between, let me just use basic words, between right and wrong. So do I struggle with relativism? Next around, just extreme, the delicate dance that we dance around that dualism. Do I, do I allow myself into personal interpretation of what God expects of me? What, what do I mean by that? Okay, let me not even go to expect what God says in his word, in the gospel. Some of the struggles we have in our micro settings around living the spiritual life in a secular world. First for me, it's flowing from just 
relativism. Second is the penchant that I see around us. If the penchant to, 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 to bring the whole interpretation of the message of the gospel to my own, the, the way I see it. It's not a matter of the way I see it. It's the way God sees it and as interpreted by the church. Sometimes the dance we dance around this dualism is around that. Uh, I don't know, maybe I still have two or three minutes. Not being bold about one's identity can be part of the issues I see when you try to diagnose, okay, why do I have this struggle? Why is it a struggle at all? We already know the two kingdoms are at war with themselves, but I'm a citizen of one. I have the, I, I know victory is already assured. I'm, I'm supposed to live out the promise of victory, the reality of victory. But why do I still struggle? Relativism, me trying to have my own pocket uh, interpretation of gospel, not being bold about my identity. Of course, the popular one wanting to belong is connected with not being bold with my identity. Wanting to belong, not, liking, not wanting to be different out there. Uh, if I just may mention one again, so I'm not timing myself, so I hope I'm not taking more than the time I'm allotted. So not having a single-minded focus around what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm pursuing multiple goals. I want to please this one. I want to wear the cloth that pleases this one. I want to arrange my body that we we, we we be acceptable in that area and all of that. And there is no central fulcrum around which all of those things rotate, which is the, the reality of being a child of God. If I am waffling around that, around that uh, single-mindedness, then I will have more issues around managing the duality. So a dualism. So I'm just, let me stop there in terms of the, uh, the, the door I try to open is, okay, I know I'm in this. The reality is that I cannot live outside this world. God said, be in the world, but not of the world. So that's the reality. And if I'm there, why do I struggle? The two kingdoms have uh, opposing uh, values. Okay, I'm supposed to be in one, leave it out and advance them. Why do I struggle? Relativism, interpretation by myself, not being bold about my identity, wanting to belong and lacking single-mindedness. Praise God. Thank you very much, brother. Um, you brought out issues of relativism there. Um, let me call on Sister Eno Edet. And um, I want to throw a question here. How do you ensure that the issues that arise, whether in the workplace or um, in your ordinary life, in your relationships, that you are able to stand your ground as a child of God when the issues arise that require you to do so. Please unmute yourself. Oh, so sorry. I was just talking away. <laughs> okay. I, I, I think that this is the struggle we have today. And um, the world has become so challenging that we really need to define and know who we are. That for me is the starting point. Knowing whose daughter I am and whose child I am is the starting point. And when Jesus says um, we are the salt of the earth, we are the light of the world, how do I bring this to my secular life? How do I bring this to my workplace? How do I bring this to my relationship? If I do not know who I am, who Christ says I am, and who I am in Christ, and stand by that identity, which uh, Dr. Murphy does spoke about, then it's very difficult for me to want to be, to live the life that Christ has called us to live. And the world hasn't made it any easier. With the sometimes you are boxed into a corner that makes you feel like you don't have a choice. It's a case of take it or lose it, especially when it comes to workplace and all such places where you may not have too many options. So you have to decide, do I want to follow the crowd? Do I want to stand by what Jesus said? And that has his own price. Am I willing to pay that price? 
And for me as a person, my guiding principle is whose daughter I am. Whose daughter am I? What would the Lord have me do under this circumstance? And once I'm able to establish that position, I call on the Holy Spirit and I stand by it. And what I've come to realize is that one way or the other, I'm always most often than not, and I can almost say 90, 90 95% of the time, being able to ensure by the power of the Holy Spirit that those values that I hold dearly by virtue of the gospel are not eroded, whether in my workplace or relationship. And God has always come out true. So I knowing who I am, first of all, in Christ Jesus, this is starting, it's, it's, a, it's very fundamental for me to um, live in that life. Once I can define that and I define it by virtue of the gospel, and then I look at it and refuse to allow the world define for me how I need to live that life. Because that is what I tend to see where the world wants to define for you give you an interpretation or an understanding or its own meaning of what those values are, its own meaning of what Jesus was saying in their own terms to suit the purpose for which they're, to, the purpose they're trying to drive. And if you're not clear about that, then you will follow the flow because you do not want to lose the, uh, the position you found yourself. So it's a case of, it's a balancing act, but it's a balancing act that must see Jesus on the throne by allowing ourselves to be the source of the earth. We need to be able to influence our environment, influence our relationships, influence what we do and let the world know who we are. And once the world knows who you are, I find that that 90% of the time, they are careful also about what they bring into your space because they already know the values you hold and are not going to, and they know that you're not going to give ground to what they're saying. So for me, that is who, um, how I would like to define how to take care of the issues that come to us in terms of our workplace, in terms of our values, in terms of our Christian faith, and being able to balance the two together. Once people know who you are, once people you, once people know the values you stand for, once people know that your faith is what defines you, then they think twice about the things they bring before you, or they already know what your answer is going to be, what your response is going to be, how you are going to act, and our careful about bringing certain things before you. Thank you. Do you have any example you want to give us? A brief one, quickly, of an experience you had. <laughs> okay, so um, I have a couple, a couple of them. Okay, let me give this one. A few years ago, I mean, I worked in a space where um, people needed, people expect you to do um certain things um, to be able to get your way or get what you want done. So I worked in a place where I dealt a lot with government in certain matters, government establishment, government uh, agencies. And there was already a system in place where when you come, you give certain things to be able to get what you want. And, and I got into that space and I, it was not hidden. In my own case, they didn't even know me. So I walked in just like any other person and they told me point blank that this is how it is here. And I turned around at that point and I'm like, okay, and this was a very critical deal for my company. And I didn't know how else I was going to get around it. But what I did was that in the space, I had about a space of about five, 10 minutes. I simply walked into the convenience where I, I just told him to give me a few minutes. I walked into the convenience and I called on the Holy Spirit. And I said, you know that this, your daughter is not going to do this thing. So give me a way out of it and let me not even go through this road. And as I got back to where I was to have the conversation, the person I was having the conversation with was no longer there. 
I bet somebody else seated and he was to take over the conversation. And when the conversation had progressed halfway through, this conversation of what they wanted, he didn't come in, the other person came back in. And when he came back in, he brought up the conversation again, subtly. And I said, you know what? Everything we have in life from God is free of charge. And this one that we're doing as well is also going to be the same way. And so therefore I expect us to understand that this is not something that we do in my company. And then the man said to me, you know that we have to eat. Even God expects us to eat. I said, I know that they have the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He provides for all of us. And the other man just said, my sister, you've spoken well. Let's just continue. And to God be the glory. I didn't sign anything. I didn't provide anything. I gave nothing and the deal was signed. And that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We call on sister, sister Charles. Thank you, Are we here? Yes. Okay, um, thank you so much, uh, the people who spoke before me. Um, I really want to quickly make two distinctions about this spiritual and temporal. Um, uh, Father talked about dualism, but my God, the God that we serve is also the God of the public and the private. He is a God in the spiritual realm, and he's also the God in the secular. He rules over all men. He rules in the dungeons. He rules in the air. He rules in the government office. So he's a God that is present always. So he is not to aligned. And that's why as Christians, wherever we are, we have to integration of our faith into the secular means that's like, like what um, Enno just expressed now and, and, and shared in the story is this feeling of the presence of God in every action that I am doing. Now, um, I want to say something about our country, Nigeria. You know, I, when you look at how many churches we have in Nigeria, how many people, how many pastors, how many Christians, all over the place, wherever you go, you see multitude of people. And you ask yourself, in a country with so much crowd, and still we are steeped in corruption. And, and corruption is not just corruption in high places, but corruption in the markets. The market women are corrupt. You go to schools from nursery to the secondary level, to the university level, you find people and you, you go into the streets. Beggars, beggars, will, somebody will pretend to be a beggar and just to get the money. So we are talking about a decayed society. We are talking about how to be a Christian, a real Christian, a converted Christian. You know, there are Christians that are not yet converted, you know, to become a converted Christian. And, and that's what I think both uh, Emma Fidon you know, and Father want to point out, which I'm trying to a kind of uncouple it this integration of faith and in the secular. For me, what we call secular is that space that people think that God doesn't exist, that there is no God there. God does not exist there. So we can do whatever we like. Any immorality can take place. Any injustice can take place. Any evil can take place. Now, let me look a little bit at the testimony people shared in the burial of Dr. Beret. You know, one of the astounding testimony was that even in the oil company, people know there are cultism in the oil company. There is a lot of evil going on in the, in the oil company. But this man stood out. And the first thing, like, like, like Eno said, the, the, even um, uh, Emma said that, the moment you encounter him, the first thing you see is the power of God around him. You know, and we find ourselves in, in a world where some of these great jobs, for you to be there, you must belong to one cult or the other, whether it is a, a secret cult or some cult groups, you know, um, just for you to be a monk, for you to belong. And, and that is what one of us said at the beginning. So, um, secular and the spiritual are integrated in one place because you that is in the secular world the so-called secular world is the believer like fathers explained you are also that child of god you are also that that person that is um embodied spirits okay so a baptized christian 
somebody who had been converted. So the, the problem is, how can we become Christians in a society like Nigeria that is so decayed, regardless of the church, the worship we do every day, and the hallelujah that we shout? So we need that. Well, I understand. I understand. I understand. There is a missing link. There is a goal. Yes, t shirt also. What we, what we should live is how our life, and, 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 and Father said that, transform the society where we are in, how to become real Christians, so that that God who reigns in the private, we reign in the, in the public, so that that God who we profess in the worship center, so we become the same God that we serve in our workplaces, in the marketplaces. It, it, it may not be even about you and me who are here. It might actually be about people we teach outside, people we encounter outside. That is the only thing that can transform our society. We need Dr. Okwere again in the world. I will, I will stop there. Thank you very much, sister. Thank you very much. Um, what I brought out of what you said is the question of being able to stand your ground and be recognized for who you are. And that was what Dr. Opere stood for. Everyone who came across him knew exactly what he was and who he was. You were never in any doubt about it. We'll call on um, Dr. Ama now. Can we have your own opinion on the subject matter? Okay, thank you, sister. I, I would build on what Father said. I think Brother Mafido and the rest spoke about it. How do we stand our ground? You know, if you wait, until you get to the abode of the Devara before you decide who you are. Chances are that the Devara will either swallow you or what you see there will terrorize you and you will take a decision that is wrong. So I always want to go back. That question that Father raised, why am I on earth? I'm on earth to know God, to love him, to serve him in this world, and to be happy with him in the next. That is who I am. It doesn't change. But in the world, I will have many roles to play. And one of them is being someone who works or someone who is a trader, or someone who does this or that. That is not what defines me. So I will make up my mind that I have many roles to play on earth, but the definition of who I am that lasts to eternity is one. That means that wherever I am, that any role I'm playing, I have decided that who I am will come up there. So when I get there and the world will behave the way Prophet said, Brother Mafia said, it is naive. We are naive if we think the world is a place of pleasure. So when I get there and the wolves and things that want to devour are there, because I know who I am that definition guides my behavior, guides the relationship I keep there, guides everything that I do. So it is not the question of when I get into the problem, I start looking for what to do. I know what to do before the problem comes. Is the problem going to come in the secular world? It is going to come because the world is under a different authority that does not obey the authority that gave me to live this life. They don't obey it and they will not obey it. So it doesn't matter what they want to do. I know what I want to do. If you see the story of Joseph, 
Joseph went to Potiphar's house. Even when the Potiphar's wife wanted him to do something which would have been hidden. If you see the comment that Joseph did, Joseph didn't say it is wrong. Joseph said, how can I do this thing against God? And you and I know that God was not physically there, but Joseph saw himself as somebody who, he asked himself, is this who God wants me to be? And that was the base. Everything that happened to Joseph until eventually he became the king. He was going down. So the world will, if you want to live out who you are, you are going to pass through persecution. But the issue is this. Are you willing to pass through it in order to retain your identity? Or are you not willing to? Once you are not willing, they're fine. You will lose your identity. But if you are willing, you are going to pass through that persecution. You will get to where you are. Even if you don't get to the highest place you want to be, but there is joy in you that I went into a very unfavorable place and I'm able to live out who I am. So in nutshell, if you don't decide who you are and who you want to be, it's a difficult thing to go into the world and want to define it there. The world has a way of leading you to define what you don't even like. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, brother. So we have heard from our five panelists. And um, what has come out of this is choose this day whom you will serve. You know, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That was, you know, um, the word of Joshua. So we go back now to our, our, um, our the members of our audience. Let us hear from them. What would you do? There, is, there are the values of the world and there are the values of the kingdom. The question is, which values do you stand for? And as we have been told, it's something that you have to decide beforehand. You need to know this is what I stand for. So that when you are confronted by the facts, or by an experience, you won't just be trying to decide. You need to have, you know, a mindset concerning certain things. And that mindset would be, what would Jesus do if he was Jesus in this situation? So when we know those type of things in advance, we can then be able to react. Even if we're woken up from sleep, we can react as we are supposed to react. And always remember, as Sister Eno said, a word of prayer to ask the Holy Spirit to so please help you to make the right decisions. And the word of God says that he will give you the words that you will speak. So that at the time when you are confronted by this kind of evil, the Lord will give you the word to speak. A word that will be as salt or as light in that situation. Okay, let us go to our audience now. We will take interventions from five people. You have two minutes each. Is there anybody who would like to say something regarding what uh, the topic of this discussion? I think it would be no nice to have- No hands up. Um, Sister Felicia's hand is up, yes. Okay. Sister Felicia, you want to say something? Okay, let me go to, okay, hand is up. All right then, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Jerry and- um, all the all panelists who have spoken. Um, one thing I would like the panelists to consider is this. We've spoken about a dichotomy between the secular life and the spiritual life. But um, yes, there is a point at which you will definitely see that dichotomy. But have we considered also the fact that there are some things that are, that are common to us that are just basic human um, mm -hmm. values, I would say that even if you're not a Christian, you know that this thing is good. 
just because you're a human being created by God. So there, so it's true that there's some aspects of life. For example, there's some laws in some lands, in some countries that totally go against the gospel and on which many Christians are being tested today. You know, I heard when Sister Eno said, oh, they may not bring this into your space because they know who you are. It's, it's the exact opposite is happening now in many countries where they will bring it into your space precisely because they know you're a Christian and they will be recorded in the background so they can use it against you in the future. You Know, especially on these issues like LGBTQ issues, we've seen where students have been rusticated from school because you know they 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 put up a, a gospel quotation saying you know homosexuality is wrong, and you know there's that case of that student in the, in one of the, one UK university, for example, there are the cases of the Christian bakers where uh, a couple, a gay couple, will come and say uh, make make our best uh, wedding cake for us precisely because I know you're a Christian baker. So that is on the one hand, but however, what I find is that. Many of us Christians, especially in Nigeria, we have some big ticket items on which we say we're not, we won't com compromise. We won't compromise on sexual morality. We won't compromise maybe on bribery and corruption, some very obvious things. But when it comes to some little things that we consider to be little, you know, diligence, in our work, punctuality. These are things that are common to everybody. Everybody knows that you go to work, you have to get to work on time. You have to be diligent in your work. We tend to compromise on those things. And then when things don't go well for us in the office, we are then, oh, we begin to cast fire and brimstone on, on, the, on the witches and wizards in our office who don't want us to progress. And that is where precisely I see that Dr. Okpere stood out. He was he, whether in his secular life, he was he had an excellent spirit. That's what I'm trying to say. He had an excellent spirit. So it wasn't just on the big ticket morality issues, but he was spotless even in the way he did his work. He was spotless. He was courteous. He was punctual. He was always extremely punctual. He was, you know, those things that even a Muslim, even a pagan will, will say, you know, even they strive for those things in the workplace because they understand that this is the way to work. So if we as Christians cannot stand out in those things, then do we have a right to then start talking about, um, um, I mean, a battle? You understand what I'm trying to say? When, when you yourself are not even... Um, I don't know how to put it, when even the most fundamental, um, what I would call human virtues, they're virtues not because necessarily because you're a Christian, but because you're a human being. You're not even living those things. And I'm speaking to myself as I'm, as I'm, um, I'm sharing this and asking the panelists also to, um, to comment on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister Polisha. You may lower your hand now. Is there anybody else who would like to make an intervention? Anyone else? Nobody? Okay, let us go back then to the panelists. And um, Sister Folusha raised some issues there about you know things to do with people actually coming to you because they know that you profess to be a Christian. The whole idea being to trip you up or to see whether you will stand your ground or whether you will fall. Have you ever had such an experience? And what do you think about this? Can I start? Uh, start with yes. Response? Okay. Um, uh, it was so very good that uh, she made a distinction between uh, Nigerian society and probably some of these Western societies in which, of course, I am also living in there. Um, actually, that distinction is very, very necessary because how you understand your your Christian identity in in Africa today is different from how you will understand your Christian identity and the challenges that you face. So another important point she made uh, that will also attract my comment is um, this whole idea of the diligence that uh, how we do our work diligently and how we are you know committed to it and all that. And that's why when I when I give an example, even in that Nigerian society where we, you know, there are things that that seems to be normal, uh, we are not we don't have challenges with that. It's like when you come into people's office, I have had that experience when I came home to collect my, my original certificate and 
um, people are paid to do this job. Most of those people um, in that office were Christians. They were not Muslims. Um, they were not pagans. They were actually Christians, and they claim also to be born again. But at the same time, there were pies of pies that needed to be attended. At the time, it was almost 10 o'clock. The person who, the secretary to the office, is not yet even in the office. Okay. By the time she came around 11, the secretary, the registrar, was not in the office. The secretary to the registrar was not in the office, and these people are paid. So, and, 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 and for her to bring that out is for me why I say that. For me, the distinction is not even clear what we call the secular and the, 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 the spiritual, because in, in that secular, like the, the environment where I live, we are, we can say they don't have faith anymore, but they don't joke with their work. They, 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 they are punctual, they are diligent, they are committed to it. There is no compromise when it has to do with the law. They, they, they are just, they are fair in what they do because they have to uphold the standard. So what, what is my role as a Christian? What, what extra can I bring in such an environment? Okay, so it's, it's, it, for me, it's, it's a serious remark that she made there. And my answer to that will be just the same thing that when Jesus said, until your righteousness is greater than the Pharisees. You know, when Jesus said that, he said, until your righteousness is greater than that of the Pharisees. And who are these Pharisees? They're all law keepers. And they try to keep everything. But something is also needed from them, which a Christian should live above that. Not just be punctual and all that, but the acts. You know, somebody asked me, today, there are many young girls who are virgins, okay? So they don't mess around. They, are, they pray. So there are many young girls who can live austere lives, okay? They live a life of uh, poverty. They don't, they're not materialistic. There are these young girls who are very obedient to the church, and, but they're not sisters. So what is the difference between me and them? And, and, and that was what somebody asked me. What's the relevance? What's, what's my relevance in the world of today? It took me about five minutes pause to actually reflect, to realize that actually what I think I represent in the last 50 years is being questioned today because that, that space we call secular. There are people who are doing that more than myself who is in the convent. And it dawned on me that more is demanded of me. More is required of me. That means if I'm teaching, I have to teach with care. I have to look at my students as human beings and not just, just product where I pump what I want to teach. There is something I do with them when I teach them. I try to listen to their emotions in the class. Some of them whose parents are sick in the hospital, they are disturbed. A normal classroom teacher in Germany would not do that. They would just come to class to deliver. So it's important. And I accept that and I acknowledge that comment that that is exactly where we need to begin to integrate our faith and live even more than a normal person who is virtuous, who is humanistic. Let me use that word, humanism. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sister. So you've reminded us once again about our duty as Christians, the duty of love, the duty to go beyond just doing a job properly because it is a job, but going beyond to act out our faith, you know, to be uh, people who carry the light of Christ where we are. So you're teaching children and you're not just teaching, going there to dish out information. You are building them up, you know, building them up and imparting into them the life that Christ has given to you. Thank you very much. We also heard about uh, Dr. Aquere having an excellent spirit. I think Felicia described him as that. So we are called to have an excellent spirit, a spirit that, you know, that is nurtured by that relationship that we have with Christ. Okay, let us see. Do we have any further interventions from any of the panelists? Hello, Bimesha. It's raising his hands. Sorry? Hello. I didn't hear you. Hello, Bimesha. Okay, somebody's hand is up. Okay. Yes. Okay, so can we have Mesha please unmute yourself? Please unmute yourself. Thank you. Okay. I just Thank did. you. Um, 
the one thing I remember about uh, Dr. Kisito Pere is his dedication to excellence. Um, we, um, I remember this scripture, uh, Proverbs 18 verse nine, that says that whoever is slothful in his work is brother to him who destroys. So um, um, indeed, um, the spirit of mediocrity of uh, not, not exerting ourselves to, uh, to produce the best, being satisfied with mediocrity is a destruction of a people. And um, I, I just, uh, it just occurs to me that indeed, as we talk about not um, bribery and corruption, just, uh, just lack of uh, lack of striving for the best that God equipped our minds to produce, to provide in any job that we're given. Um, we, we are accountable to God. Is this the best that we could have done? Did we give more enough thought to this average uh, outcome versus what could be an excellent outcome if we sought the Holy Spirit, the creator, to give us, is this the best or is there a better way? Thank you. Kisito was that type of a man who applied his mind as well as his heart to any task he was given. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Elobi. Thank you very much for that intervention. Please lower your hand. Um, yes. Do we have any other interventions yes. as we yes. wind down? Hi. Okay. Especially regarding testimonies. Okay, we have Violet Opere. Violet Opere. Okay. Unmute yourself. Your microphone is not on. Oh, okay. Unmute yourself, please. Okay. Um, sorry. So, 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 I just wanted to let me go up for one minute. Yeah, thank you. This has been very interesting. Um, I wanted to add what I saw in Nadi Kisito um, on this topic. And that was one with the spirit. He was a great advocate of life in the spirit seminars. And um, after his death, I attended. And then I realized that it is only by the power of the Holy Spirit that we can actually live in this secular world as children of God. It's, and, and, and it was very evident in his life because when you live a life of the spirit, the fruits of the spirit are what differentiates the secular um, world like diligence and, you know, even people have challenged me before that you have people that don't know Christ, but are full of love, you know? So it's the fruits of the spirit, the love for God, humility, patience, kindness. And we only really get that when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and we do get the life in the spirit. We live the life in the spirit as we dedicate our time um, to attending life in the spirit and following on from there, you know, attending Bible studies, just soaking ourselves in the word of God, increasing in the knowledge of God. And that was something I saw that he did. And, and in trying to do that, I see how it can continually help um, as we try to live that differentiated life. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for that intervention. Um, it is very much appreciated that it is by the power of the Holy Spirit that we can bear the fruits of the spirit and live out you know, all those uh, values in this world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have anybody else? Yes, Any I want to add something. I want to add something. Okay, yes, please go ahead. Father. Yes. Now, um, thank you for all the interventions and inputs on this topic, very interesting, and we keep on discussing it.
In the um, sent, I, this topic, first of all, takes me back to the ancient writing of Augustine, where he wrote in 1470, um, he described the city of God. And in that book, he tried to highlight two cities, the city of God and the city of the world, the earthly city, the pagan city. And um, not going to really get into the intricacies of the book, but the, the, uh, what he outlined are the features of these two cities. First of all, he said members of those who are of the, uh, of the heavenly city are those who forgo earthly pleasure, have dedicated themselves to eternal truths. That is the word of God and Christian truth. And but those who are in the city of the world are people who have amassed themselves, amassed themselves in the cares of pleasure of this present age and this present world. Okay, we can look at this and continue to look at this dualism that people, Christians, um, how much earthly pleasures are we ready to forego? And how much are we dedicated to the to the work of eternal truth. How ready are we even to give up our lives for truth? And for those values we know that are Christian values, even when it is to our own disadvantage, but we say we have dedicated ourselves to the truth. Or do we mingle the two options that we are in the city of God and also in the city of the world that we immerse ourselves in the cares and pleasures of this present age? Of course, the cares and worries are clear. We have to feed our family. We have to take care of ourselves bodily. But then how much are we dedicated? How much have we killed the earthly pleasures and dedicated ourselves? It's a dedication. So Augustine calls it a dedication. That means it, has, it is a fundamental decision that I am dedicating myself to eternal truth, no matter what happens. But I will have to link it to um, one of the readings we had at the second memorial of, of the first memorial one year of Dr. Kizito Pere, which we read in Daniel 6 3. Talking and thinking about Daniel, who lived in the pagan world of Babylonia, was taken captive from the city, from Jerusalem down to the Babylonian city. He lived his colleagues, and those who were around him were definitely people who were classified as pagans. But even within that pagan world, Daniel was able to excel. And Daniel chapter six verse three says, Daniel was preferred by the pagan king because an excellent spirit, an excellent spirit was dwelling in him. And that excellent spirit is the spirit of God was dwelling in him. And we can look at that when, the, when Violet made the comment of the Holy Spirit. And I think Dr. Kizito Pere dedicated his, his life in doing life in the spirit seminar for various peoples. And it's all the way of saying, how do I open my heart for the excellent spirit of the Holy Spirit to dwell in me? You know, we, the mingling of the city of God and the city of the world, they are all the same place. They don't have different geographical locations. We definitely have to work. We don't, as Christians, live in a different world and pagans live in a different world. If we look at the company where you serve and where you get, you earn your living, there are, is not Christian company, of course. And you, as a Christian, some companies, you're not supposed to work there. But you can look at Daniel, who even lived in the pagan country, in a pagan palace of serving the king of Babylon, Babylonian king. But he opened his heart to the excellent spirit of the Holy Spirit. So the thing is, have I opened my heart that the Holy Spirit will take over me completely and take over you and you dedicate yourself and said, I make a vow today even though I work on the same computer and produce the same documents as my colleagues who don't even know about Christ, but I am going to do it exceptionally because of the excellent spirit that is in me. 
if there's mm. any case going to come to my case, my table, I am going to deal with this because of the excellent spirit of God that is dwelling in me. And we know we cannot run away from the presence of God because we know that if we dedicate, he is there omnipresent everywhere we are, as um, 139 will say, where can I run from God's presence? So that morning, afternoon, and wherever I am, even at my walking space, I am before God's presence. And I use this table where I am walking as a dedicated table, as an altar, where I worship God and dedicate myself to the service of eternal truth and the kingdom of God. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father. Thanks a lot. We're still pursuing this excellent spirit. The Lord will give us the grace for that excellent spirit in Jesus' name. So, um, can we take one, one minute each from Sister Eno and Dr. Ama so that we can round up and then we'll take um, a word from Sister Folisho about the center. Okay. Um, we? I... Uh, your father was your father was talking about the two cities. A, a, a preacher once said that God made the church to be in the world, but that the world should never come into the church, which is like a sheep. The sheep functions very well when the sheep is in the sea. But immediately the sheep has a hole and water begins to come in, that sheep is going to sink. And I link it to the prayer of the church that says, God, allow us, help us to use wisely the things of the world, but to stick to the things in heaven. There is a thin line between those two cities. You can't avoid them. God purposely decided that we will be in that city. But while in that city, we must make a difference and ensure that we recognize what belongs to that city and what belongs to the city we are in. And make sure that we are doing everything to draw attention to that thing that belongs to that city so that we can make disciples of people. When we begin to categorize issues as big and small, we run the danger of living a life that is just a little bit, if it is at all, better than the life of the people in the world we are talking about. We are called to a life of excellence. And that excellence must be lived in every role that I play. In my work, in whatever assignment they give to me, the spirit that operates in us is the spirit of excellence. And will tell you that you must achieve excellence in all that you do. Now, if you are decide not to, then if you are being tried and you suffer, Peter said you should suffer for doing what is right, not for doing what is wrong. If I decide that excellence is not what I am and there is a penalty in my office, then I shouldn't run back and say I am suffering because I am a child of God. No, I am suffering because I lived this. Simple, I didn't live like a child of God. If I live like a child of God, I may suffer. But Peter said, be glad on that suffering. But I shouldn't suffer because I lived a life that is not the life of a child of God. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much, brother. Mrs. Sedet. Thank you. I'd like to take off from where Dr. Ma has said. Um, and for where I see things, God has a reason why he made us live in this world together. We, so we live the spiritual in a secular world. There's a reason why good and evil are in the same space. 
And I was going through um, the CCC today and um, CCC 395, and it was talking about how God had permitted the devil almost, so to speak, run amok, so to speak, allowed him. There's a reason. And so when Jesus said, you are the light of the world, you are the salt of the earth, there's a reason. If the evil was not there, then there's no way the light will shine. It's simple and short. Everywhere will be light. So there's nothing to highlight anything that is bad. So whether it's big or small, whichever world we find ourselves, the point is, as a child of God, I, my light must be such that it is above board. It must be the light of Christ. It, there are no two ways. There are no in between. I might suffer some consequences, but that is the sacrifice I have to make. And like Dr. Ma was saying as well, let it be that I'm suffering for the right reason. I can't go and I can't go and expect somebody to live an, an exemplary life when I, I am not living an exemplary life. There has to be that distinction. My light must so shine that men cannot fault it. So we must, I as a person, must show forth that light, must show forth that glory. Somebody shared something in my group today when the priest ended the mass this morning. He said, go in peace. The mass is ended. Go forth to let your life show forth the glory of God. And she brought it up for discussion on our platform. And that it was the very first time that it rang a bell in our head, you know. But that's what it is, that I, my, my, my Christianity, my spiritual life shouldn't just be seen in the house of God. But in every space I find myself, whether my office, my home, in my relationship, in the way I talk, the way I move, the way I drift, I, it, the light of Christ must show forth. And so that the name of the Lord will be glorified. And I think that for me as a person, for any Christian, that is what we need to pursue every day. And like um, has also been shared, we can only live that life by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we need the Holy Spirit every day, every day, every day to shine that light in us so that we can also leave it and shine it out wherever we find ourselves. So for me, that for me will be the round that might take in all of this, that we should always and every way show for that glory by the power of the holy spirit we may suffer consequences but it's a sacrifice god has called us to make and as we make that sacrifice he always makes a way out for us at the end of the day let it be that we are suffering for the right cause and not for the wrong cause thank you thank you very very much brothers and sisters we have um, come to the end of this session and um by the grace of God, this is the beginning of many people to come. Thank you all for all your interventions. Um, thank you all for your participation, your very active participation. We will now call on um, a member of the Opera family. And we have somebody please to say a word or two, just yeah. for a minute. Yes, Madam Eugene here. Uh, oh, okay. Um, uh, first of all, I think my dad will be smiling down from heaven when he sees this. I think this is exactly where he would expect us to be spending our time and effort. And just permit me to make a few comments also on this topic. Um, I have to say I learned what he was trying to teach very late in my life. And I would argue it's maybe only in his death that I truly understand what he was trying to teach. I understood the duality of the world, but I felt that you had to compartmentalize it to survive. There's my Christian life and there's the life in, um, in the world. And um, he always preached against that. And I think in him, he understood the duality of the world, but in the way he approached it, there wasn't a difference in approach. And my own reflection is that that was obviously completely wrong. And we know the Bible verse that talks about you're neither hot nor cold, um, and therefore you're useless. We need to be out. It's the worst of both worlds, and we have to be able to stand up, even in the in the uh, even at the fear of consequences, 
Because how else will we know? How else will the world know our rights? And I have one example I just want to share briefly, which was my greatest fear that came about two years ago. Uh, so most of you know, I followed my dad's footsteps. I also work in show. And this whole issue of LGBTQ um, has been one that has plagued me about what would I do if I'm ever put on this spot and ask my opinion on this. And um, I'll cut a long story short, but there was a famous meeting I was part of and unbeknownst to me, uh, they were gonna bring the LGBTQ community to us. And uh, most people around that table know my views. And I thought I'll just keep quiet and allow it escape until five minutes to the end of that meeting, somebody turned to me point blank and asked me, and I nearly panicked, but I asked like just a bit like what you did the sister mentioned, I just said two words of prayer. And I just came out and said, to be honest, I don't believe in this. So you can't ask me as a Christian to stand for it. But what I believe in and what my faith teaches me is that just because you have a different belief or different thing, you shouldn't be discriminated. So on that principle, I understand it, but please don't expect me to be a supporter or sponsor. And there was like dead silence. I got some challenges. But what was interesting afterwards is many people came to me who were closet Christians, so to speak, and thanked me for being brave enough to do that. So I think the principle I took and the thing my dad was trying to teach me was that exactly what the sister said about good and evil, and we're meant to be the light of this world, is we're meant to show the example as ordinary men and women serving God that we need to stand up. Uh, so um, I think I only learned that. There. So thank you very much. And this is why we're so pleased that life, on behalf of the Osperia family, we want to thank you for all the support, friends, relations, and wife and father, Sylvester, and all of those who have poured out such love and uh, that has made it easier for us to deal with the loss. But actually that this uh, program will extend his legacy and will be exactly what he expects us to do. And the last maybe advice I will please offer is, um, you know, don't put away what you can do today for today. Personally, I thought my dad would live forever. And it was, it rocked my world and it turned me upside down um, when he died. But you know, sometimes a good seed needs to die to generate fruit. So let's allow this to generate the fruit of God so that we also go, uh, having lived his own life, we also live our own life and meet our maker. Thank you very much on behalf of uh, the Opera family. Thank you and God bless. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. God bless you. Thank you. Um, please give our warm regards to our sister and everybody else. And um, we now call on Sister Furusho. Please give us a few words about the center and then Father will pray for us and give us a blessing. Thank you very much, Sister Jerry. So um, this is the inaugural session of the Kisito Center for Integral Faith Formation, which was launched last year. However, it will certainly not be the last and we expect um, in the very near future to begin to generate a lot more content on, um, on social media, YouTube in particular. So, um, the, the plan is to have regular video uploads on topical issues. Um, contributors will be from, from um, life members and, men and other well-grounded um, Catholics. We also expect to use in particular, you know, the, the YouTube shorts because we understand that social media and um, the current generation has a very short attention span. But um, the YouTube shorts, for example, less than five minutes are a very powerful tool for sharing sound bites, which can um, which could actually change a person, help a person to sit down and think. You know, just one short um, sentence could could cause a person to go back and think about a few things about their lives and 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 hopefully um, lead them to Christ. And um, this is what we plan to start with. I'm sure in the future there will be many other initiatives, but we want to start on the on the social media space. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sister Felicia. So um, having said that, we want to round up now. We have spent um, a little over an hour. So we invite Father Sylvester 
spiritual director of life to please give us a closing prayer and a blessing. Brother Sylvester, am I missing something? I can't seem to hear anything. Else. Unmute yourself. Okay. okay, thank you. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. So I thank you for being here, and we believe that this center will continue to grow to give God the glory. And as we continue to please send me the, the, your own sound bite, as Felicia said, just a little clip, and we get it on on the YouTube, okay. let's begin to create content, content of evangelization. You can do it on your own and we'll continue to hold the panel conversations as Felicia has already said today. And we continue to give testimonies to a life well lived. Dr. Kizito better lived a good Christian life. And we cannot keep our mouths shut talking about this. We cannot keep our mouth shut talking about this. So mm -hmm. commit him into God's hands and ask him to intercede for us as well, who are here on earth still at the level of the church ministry, that we continue to do our work of evangelization. So in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness today. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the life of your servant, Kizito. We thank you for the examples he lived on earth and the examples he lived, he left for the legacy he left for his family, for the members of life and for the entire Christendom, especially in Nigeria and other parts and people he touched their lives so deeply. Lord, grant him eternal rest and the noble crown of eternal glory. Turn on earth, Lord, to bless and protect the family. Console them and give them the inner strength to continue to march on, to continue to fight the battle of good faith at the various areas they find themselves. Give them the inner strength to endure and the strength to step out to the responsibilities of today, which their dad left for them. Encourage us as members of life to continue to bear witness to our Christian faith, to continue to be the light in the dark, in the dark world, continue to be dedicated to the eternal truth, that the excelling spirit will continue to dwell in us. Bless and consecrate this channel. Bless and consecrate this center today, that this center will continue to bring bear fruits catch and bring souls to God's kingdom and give us the grace to multiply and populate the world, increase the number of the righteous on the world because the world will be saved when the number of the righteous continues to increase. Let the light continue to shine in darkness, in the dark world. For all who participated today, give them the strength to continue to be a witness to the truth of the gospel and the truth of our Christian lives. Lord, grant eternal rest to your servant and strength to us, the grace to all of us who are still on earth to continue to live the life of Christian faith. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our birth. Amen. May the soul of Jesus be and the souls of all the faithful departed. Lord, bless you, Lord. Rest in peace. Amen. May the soul of Christ be and the souls of all the faithful departed. May the soul of Christ bear and the souls of the faithful depart. Amen. Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Father.
Thank, Thank you, everyone. I just want to acknowledge the presence of Reverend Father Mike Umame. Um, I was just, um, it was just brought to my notice that he's one of the participants in this session. Father Mike, you're welcome. It's great to see you here. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, Thank you, everybody. for participating. See you Thank at the next you. session. God bless. Thank you. Thank you for hosting. Thank you. Thank you.